Cast leader Cleroy was stressed. His green hydrating mucus was grey. His shell was cracking in a few places, and if the juveniles weren't so similarly troubled, he'd fear they might try and devour him in his sleep and take his place. The matriarch had been bearing over them so much, he could swear he felt her standing over him even now. They were scouring every intel source they had, hidden cameras, listening devices, informants, and even bar rumours. Cleroy was confident the matriarch would crack him open and suck at his inside should he fail to have some information with his next report. His eyes scanned over more documents that were being brought into the control room by the juveniles, and they each had their own stack to pour over. Then he saw it. His claw tapped on a data slate. This! Who brought this one in? He quickly fled the report, and one of the juveniles skittered forward. When and where? The Phyllis complaint about the Cultural Dance Centre? Two Phyllis squaws entered an illegal black market station run by Bank Tears to compete in some sort of regional dance competition. One squad won, but a pair of unknown species stole the trophy. They submitted a complaint, hoping we might track them down. They were off duty, but on an illegal station, competing in an unregistered event. I thought we'd just reprimand them for wasting our time, but you said to bring in all reports regarding unknown species. Yes, yes, but when did we get this report? One standard sleep cycle ago, cast leader. Cleroy chittered out, and quickly input the coordinates into his console. The station wasn't too far from an FTL lane, which was normal. He quickly traced a path between that station and the other they staked out, only to find their prey had escaped. They had to be heading towards the core. They had travelled away from the core for a while, but were now starting to veer inwards. Very cunning of them. But now he had a route. Cleroy pulled the map back from the coordinates, travelling corewards along the FTL lanes, searching for some sort of target or point he thought they would stop at next. Then his eyes widened for a moment, and he smacked the console with his claw. Here! We will focus all our regional hunter killers here! The juveniles clustered around, and then looked up at him in confusion. Cast leader? A museum? Cleroy hissed and clicked, as the juveniles quickly skittered away before he cut one of them open. Yes! The terrorist diplomat will strike there. It has an exhibit on the regulation wars. This is the start of a new war that'll spark with their treachery. There is no doubt she'll want to attack you with her new bloodthirsty mercenary. Cleroy moved with purpose, scurrying to the communications terminal. He shoved the juvenile out of his way, typing on the console with his forelimbs. We need to send out a warning to the museum security. They must be on alert for a Libertonian. Should we have them close the museum? No. In fact... His claws paused on the console. Never mind, we won't warn them. He began to type once more. We'll instruct all hunter killers in the area to converge as we move there ourselves. We should make it in another cycle. We'll wait for them to strike and then capture them. Should I wake Carsey to Blee Bob? No. His quest for revenge is driving him blue. He's like a gleamer chaser who wandered out into the deep for too long. This has to be done efficiently. We need to capture the Libertonian and either capture or kill Billy Bob Space Trucker. Emily had been able to relax a bit more after nearly killing Billy Bob, which had been about as traumatic for her as it was for him, even though he kept making fun of her over it. That was just how he dealt with almost dying, it seemed. But as they drove along the FTO lane, his navcom pinged with info on the upcoming system. Mostly they ignored it now, since they didn't need the standard refueling stations. But as she read it over, she noticed one of the attractions and gasped out, Benny Bob, we have to stop up ahead. He jerked a bit, looking up and around for a moment at the traffic. What? Oh, sorry, not like... In the FDO lane, I meant in the system. Wow, what's up? There's a museum up ahead with a collection of art I've always wanted to see. They have paintings and sculptures and smell vistas and all sorts of things. 
The hell has a smell, Vista, and there is no way I'm going to a museum about Xeno art. Count me out. You need to get some culture that isn't human. Besides, you promised if I let you compete in that dance tournament, you'd do what I wanted to do in the next system. Billy Bob opened and closed his mouth a few times, before shutting it firmly, and thinking back onto what he said. God damn it, I didn't mean a museum. I meant like... Something I also wanted to do, but was your idea. She just stared at him from the co-pilot seat, and he groaned for a good 30 seconds while looking up at the roof of his cabin. Fan, 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 Ugh! She let out a happy chirp and held up one hand. He looked over at her, confused for a moment, before realising what she wanted. I'm not giving you a high five. What? Yes you are. Museums are high five worthy. No, they're not. Except for maybe a video game museum or a war museum. I'm sure they've got war stuff here. It's a big place. Yeah, but you want to see some... smell vistas. And other stuff. She looked at him, hands still up in the air. Billy Bob? I'm not gonna do it. Yes, you are. She said with force as she growled at him. He groaned out and then raised a hand, which he quickly slapped, and giggled with excitement. This is so fun. I've always wanted to go here. Don't worry about it. What could go wrong at a museum? I'll get so bored I'll kill myself, he said grumpily, before she started punching his shoulder. Shut up. You're going to enjoy it. I just know it. Okay, okay. Gee, stop already. He leaned away from the punching with a laugh. You're a lot more active now that you've tried to murder me. I think my blood energised you. Bleh, that's disgusting. It's just because now I know I could totally take you in a fight. Bring it on, hollow bones. I'm not an earth bird. My bones aren't hollow. You should be careful, or I might take my gloves off. He chuckled at that as she wiggled her four hands at him. Now that he thought about it, he'd never seen more than her face and wings. That cloak, survival suit thing, covered her body. Either they didn't need to bathe much, or would also help clean her feathers. He should really learn more about her species at some point. He shrugged it off as he began to downspin his engines and move through the FTL lane to get ready to exit the system near this museum she wanted to see. Unlike his normal stops, he had to actually start weaving through the regular Xenos traffic on his way to the planet. Most of the Atlas cargo ships were heading to a different port, so he was mostly moving around smaller vessels carrying tourists, and private yachts owned by wealthy families. The Xeno seemed to favour curving, asymmetrical shapes for their ships, as opposed to Billy Bob's blocky and very efficient Longhorn. He didn't care for the Xeno's designs. They were all form, no function. They were wasteful on materials, and in general looked ready to snap in any decent gravity. In fact, None of you thought about it, it was like being in an actual ship flying into an anime. Next thing you'd see was a bunch of giant mechs, sword fighting, where none of the soldiers knew how to let a target. Then he thought back on his fight on the station. Perhaps no Xeno soldiers did know how to let a target. He shrugged it off, as he focused on finding the designated lanes leading down to the correct spaceport. What's the species here like? he asked, as he glanced over at Emily. Hmm, this is a Pluvian planet, one of the founding species of the galactic government. Wealthy, high class, high social standing. They make up the majority of bureaucrats in the galactic government by a large percentage. They're fairly weak physically, but very culturally adept. Around the same height as an average Libertonian, so taller than me by a few inches. They're sticklers for rules and order, aside from art, of course. You're shorter than the average Libertonian? You didn't know that. He stared at her for a moment, before she realised why. Right, I'm the only Libertonian you've ever met. Well, I am, but only by a few inches, so it's not that bad. I'm not like a dwarf flyer. What's that? Sounds pretty cool. They're just Libertonians who are only around five and a half feet tall. Genetic disorder... They're very nimble flyers, so they were able to survive in our pre-civilized period. We have dwarves too. They survive because we like laughing at them. 
Wow, I just realized what dicks we can be as a species. Then he shrugged it off. There was a chime as they were held by the traffic control. Unidentified cargo hauler, you're entering the wrong space for traffic lane. This is for tourist and private vehicle traffic only. That's a 410, good buddy. This here is a private transport, with pilot and co-pilot only. You must have a switch wire somewhere. Our designation is... He began making noises with his mouth. That sounded like some sort of garbled transmission. Uh, please hold your heading while we... Uh, verify. Billy Bob grinned at Emily. Shit, Ground Control, I've got an exotic newly discovered animal for the museum. The curator is expecting us down there as fast as we can fall out of the sky. You really gonna hold me up because your tech is busted? You gotta sit nice and comfy while I get chewed out for your mistake. I don't need this shit today. I want your control number. Your curator shits on me, I'll make sure he shits on you too. See how you like it when the important people breathe down your neck. Ah, uh, that's... um... You're clear for the private museum, Doc. Safe flying. Thank you. That wasn't so hard now, was it? Tell you what, if things go well, I'll let them know you helped. You have a nice day. Billy Bob ended the transmission as he chuckled. God, Xenos are so easy to bullshit. So if you actually want to deal with an angry space truck with a delivery. Emily was smiling as he pulled out to the main spaceport lane and followed the directions now being displayed on his window. The planet beneath them seemed to be full of greens and whites. The cities were very densely packed as usual, with most Xeno settlements he'd seen. They liked to have a few really huge cities on their developed worlds. Most of their colonies were homes clustered together, with a field stretching out around them. They very rarely liked to live far apart from one another. He brought his longhorn down into the designated docking area behind the museum. The structures themselves were massive works of white stone, but to him they looked more like a mold colony, stretching and blobbing out in weird ways. Very organic, with almost no right angles or symmetry to the structure. Much like the ships, it looked like it would fall apart in Earth gravity. He didn't like it. There were only a few small yachts back here, no cargo haulers like his but he could see what had to be a Peluvian with a data slate walking towards them. Hmm. He had an important decision to make here as he tapped his chin, deep in thought. Space Poodle, that was it. They had fluffy furry sections along their long, lanky body. No tail, but a pointed nose that curved up, and already struck him as being stuck-up snobs. They were mostly humanoid. Pointed face, long neck into a lanky body and arms, their torso almost looked too small for their height. This one had blue tufts of tightly cold fur on its head, midsection and in two different spots on both arms and legs. The feet ending in tall, free-toed feet. The rest of it was covered in yellowish grey fabric that looked sort of like a jumpsuit with holes in it for the fur to stick through. He looked over to Emily. Okay, follow my lead and act aloof. They exited his ship as he waited for her to wait near the entrance. She crossed both sets of arms as he approached the Peluvian. No, 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 no. This simply won't do. Where's the welcoming committee? I don't see the flowers or carpet or any of it. The museum employee halted at that and looked confused. Pardon? You can't be the only person they sent to welcome her. It's just unacceptable. I need to talk to whoever is in charge of these things. She can't be subjected to such basic treatment. Ah. Uh... The Pulvian looked down at the data state and spoke again. I don't... I thought you were a cargo hauler. What? This is a cargo hauler? I'll have you know this is the latest fashion in luxury from the outer systems. It's not about how it looks, but what it carries. He nodded slowly, and then pointed at the Pulvian. What's your name? I'm going to make it very clear to the curator that you're being very unhelpful in welcoming your newest artist. Hmm. Bring in enough work for a new wing, and they don't even know who made it? Wait, wait, wait. who are you talking about? You don't even know? 
is Princess Cinnabons of the newly discovered Arsi Farties. The Galactic Council is fast-tracking their membership due to their art and culture advancements. Why do you think we're here in an outer system ship? And she has me as a servant. Have you ever seen Markham before? N no. And here I am in a ship you've never seen before in your private dart for the museum. You think we came here by accident? I, I think there's just been a mix-up. I wasn't told any of this. I'm sorry. Oh, I see. Blaming someone else, are you? Yes. No. I, uh... Billy Bob walked back to Emily and very quietly said, I'm just going to pretend we're discussing something. Look agitated. Or as much as you can with that mask on. Emily huffed, sticking her head in the air as she moved her hands around in an animated fashion. Is this really going to work? Then he nodded and walked back to the Porvian, slowly wrapping an arm around it to pull it away from Emily. The princess isn't happy, but I think I can make her see the opportunity here. If no one knows we're here, we can take a look at the layout on our own before people know who we are. Why don't you just give us two all-access passes, and I'll calm her down. You don't talk about her arrival to anyone, and we'll walk through, and then I'll call up to make sure they have a welcoming committee waiting for her in a cycle or two, okay? The Porvian shook his head in a circle-like pattern that his translator told him was the same as a nodding yes. Here. He quickly tapped on the data slate, and pulled two little black pebbles out of a pocket, handing them to Billy Bob. Please let the princess know we didn't intend on insulting her. We're thrilled to have her art here at our museum. Please enjoy yourselves. Those are special VIP passes. Any exhibit, as long as you like. Billy Bob nodded slowly, and gave the creature a very light pat. I appreciate it. Remember, don't tell anyone, or I'm going to have a very different story for your superiors. Of course. Absolute secrecy. Billy Bob smiled and walked back to Emily, as the Safa scurried away, he handed her a pebble. Well, I doubt I'll like it, but at least it was fun getting into the place. She laughed at that, and walked along with them as they headed through the private docking area, following the signs towards the main museum. It was set up as a series of indoor and outdoor exhibits, with opulent-looking gardens separating the large white buildings. Emily began to guide Billy Bob through the various gardens and exhibits. Much like she said there were sculptures, art and the smell vistas, it turned out the smell vistas were clumps of scented materials in front of pictures or places to try and give a sense of being someplace else. Some were okay, but he insisted some smelled like unspecific Xeno ass. Uxa. He actually liked the gardens best so far. Looking at Xeno modern art was rather underwhelming to him and it was hard to appreciate the craftsmanship of the sculptures when he didn't know what the fuck any of them were supposed to be. As they wandered through the gardens, he pointed to a section where a greslin in an exosuit that stood next to a display marked Exotic and Dangerous. Aphilas was wandering over towards one of the plants, looking sort of stoned and mesmerised. The greslin sprayed something in his face, and he shook it off and quickly walked away. See those plants with fangs? Venus fly traps. They're from Earth. They lure flies in and then snap shut around them and eat them. What? You have a plant that eats meat? More than one, I'm fairly sure. It's a death word after all. That's terrifying and interesting at the same time. Interfine, he said with a nod. Then he pointed to a tree in a glass dome. I forget the name, but that's pretty much a totally toxic tree. Looks nice. Kills anyone who sleeps under it. Emily couldn't believe Earth had so many plants that would harm creatures. Plants? And that didn't include the ones that were simply poison. In fact, the majority of the exotic and dangerous plants were from Earth. From what Billy Bob was telling her, they didn't even have all the real dangerous plants he could think of. But here they had at least five. How could a planet house more than five dangerous plants? Billy Bob laughed when she asked that, and caused a bit of a scene as the Xeno stared at him. The way he laughed in that loud, boisterous manner was somewhat intimidating to the more peaceful species. 
It sounded menacing and predatory to the mostly herbivore species. They were moving on when they found an exhibit on pre-FTR species. He gasped and pointed to a picture that was guiding people to the exhibit. That's the Voyager! That's the Voyager! They found it! We went back to try and track it down with our jump drives but never could locate it. They must have taken it during all that span on our music. Well, it's unlikely that the Bengtiers were involved with taking anything besides information. They listen to radio signals and watch species to see if they'll likely be good trade partners. It's illegal, of course, since the government doesn't want to risk early contact, but it's pretty easy to steal radio signals and the like without getting caught. Oh, well, whatever. It's the Voyager. He dragged her along, pointing and marvelling at some of the artefacts they had from various young species. But when they came to the section on humans was when he got really interested. His translator was playing the recorded messages that were broadcast as he touched various exhibits. This is Earth. A super gravity death world with incredible levels of water. Many dangerous plants from this planet can be found in the exotic and dangerous plant exhibit outside. At the time most of the artifacts were found, the planet rests in a perpetual state of war. The species inhabiting it is brutish and simple-minded. He laughed. Two great clans are competing over control over what little land there is. They use missiles filled with uranium, plutonium and hydrogen, arranged in such a way as to split atoms in an uncontrolled fashion, which leads to massive radioactive explosions. The species is not expected to last more than 20 solar cycles. He laughed again. In accordance with standard galactic surveys, we have taken pictures of their society once every 50 solar years, up until they first launch an object into space. After that, we surveyed once more, collected these artifacts and left them in isolation. We plan on returning after 100 solar cycles to collect more artifacts from the radioactive remains of their decaying ruins. They either forgot to do that or were disappointed we aren't dead and pretend we are, he said with a laugh and then pointed. Those are pictures from old Earth. He began to look at pictures of sailing ships and towns that had been taken. This had to be like the 1600s. They aren't close enough to really make out specifics, but still. He ran down the long corridor looking at pictures before stopping. Emily! She caught up with him, looking at a grey cratered landscape, some sort of metal and foil contraption in the background, with a red, white and blue flag in front. The caption below said, Landing site of first human moon mission. Then he gasped, as he saw a sign pointing towards the artifacts. The first one said, First human object in space. Spartnik? How did they manage that? The exhibit was fairly empty, so he didn't have to worry about disturbing anyone, as he walked into the large room and then gasped. No fucking way! Emily stepped in and looked up at some sort of pointed rocket with him. On the side there was some sort of red field with a white circle, and some strange black squiggle on it. The Nurses did beat everyone to space. Everyone figured there was no way. This is huge. Wait, but do I want to tell anyone? They were dicks. He looked at the remains they'd found in the ship. A dead pilot... A black uniform, black pressure suit that had failed, some sort of gun. An MP-44 and ammo. Why the fuck did he have that in space? Was he expecting to shoot space monsters? Ooh, a real Luger. He was pressed against the glass as he looked. Who are the Nazis? Uh, they were a bunch of not Americans who hated Jews and gays and gypsies and everyone who wasn't exactly like them. They were total dicks, but they were really good engineers and fighters. They were sort of like those enemies you really, really hate, but kind of respect because they're so fucking tough. Like Russians, but beer and engineering instead of vodka and general drunkenness. Did you guys have anyone like that? Oh, we're sort of that to the rest of the galaxy. No shit. Well, you don't genocide people, do you? What? No, not at all. We just believe in less regulation. I still don't get why there was a war over that. 
Then he finally walked down away from it to see the voyage he'd first spotted the picture of. This was the first thing we made that made it out of the system. He started reading what they knew about it and discovered something. They didn't find the record. How could they not? Jesus, that means it's still in there. He was pressed against this glass as well, staring at the Voyager. It's right there, Emily, the golden record. He looked around then and tapped the glass. Think it's got an alarm? Yes, I think it's got an alarm. Ugh. This isn't over. I'm going to make them give me that record. That's part of human history. It doesn't belong in a museum. Billy Bob, you can't just demand one of the museum pieces. Yes, I can. The lazy fox didn't even look into the Voyager and find it. He walked out of the exhibit area, ignoring the artifacts from other species, but then stopped as he saw a large, rather busy exhibit filled with tourists. The top was marked, The Regulation Wars. Billy Bob stopped and Emily slowly stepped behind him, trying to take up as little space as possible. Billy Bob, let's go. I need to see this. It just doesn't make sense to me. He began to walk through the exhibit. There were artwork pieces on either side. The founding of the council, ass faces, space poodles, flecos, some sort of space gerbil, those exosuit core, and the Libertonians. He couldn't help but notice the Libertonian was cast in the shadows and looked... evil. Then there was the massive painting called Betrayal. Libertonians in strange suits were charging some sort of meeting, shooting the other species, setting fire to the building around them. One called The Fall, We showed Libertonians in those suits falling from the sky, as the other species looked heroic, shooting at them. Finally, there was Victory. We showed the other species standing around two now suddenly small, bent and subdued Libertonians, signing some sort of document. This tells me nothing. Billy Bob muttered, even as tourists crowded around the wall-sized paintings. He found a segment past it that actually seemed to have info. He started to read the history presented there. There was a disagreement over the council. The Libertonians thought they should encourage species to aspire for greatness and remain free to develop on their own. Introduction to the council was to be voluntary, and primarily it would work as a trade union, an alliance to stop unnecessary wars. The others felt the council should begin regulating species, making sure that none grew too great or powerful in multiple ways. Those who didn't join the council would be pushed to the side and marginalised, left to stagnate without the galactic economy and technology, to start policing their laws as applied to all species where they saw fit. When the Libertonians disagreed, they moved to leave the council and start their own organisation. The rest of the council told them leaving the council was an act of war, and the Libertonians attacked first. The Libertonians struck deep into various systems and sued for peace early on, but the Asso Empire convinced the other to keep fighting. After that, it became a war of attrition, and the Libertonians were outnumbered very significantly. He read up on various battles, noting that the council races always lost at least five times as many people, and often far more. He also noted the council races would often make and break ceasefires to gain advantages. Yet they didn't engage in total war. They leave infrastructure intact and stay away from population centres. It seems Zeno's kept industrial zones far away from residential. A galaxy without the concept of total war. Even so, in the end, the Libertonians were defeated. He read the terms of surrender. It seemed like the council took a very heavy hand against the vanquished. They were no longer a council race, couldn't trade, couldn't travel, and couldn't have a military ready. Plus, just one colony off-world from their home planet. He realised why she wore a mask now. Almost no one has seen a live Libertonian in hundreds of years. Then, he stepped past that and gasped. There, behind a gleaming force field of some sort, was a tall suit made of metal, wings up and extended as if in flight. It looked like a massive Libertonian. The upper arms ended in claws, while the lower arms had some sort of energy weapon attached to them. The legs ran down into massive metal feet with four claws, three spread out on the front and one on the back. 
Is that an exosuit your people used in the war? Yes. One of the elite units will wear suits like that. You fit into it and sensors adjust the padding inside to your size. The suit was at least nine feet tall. It's gorgeous, Billy Bob muttered as he looked up at it. He saw the diagram next to it that showed a Libertonian male. Larger than Emily, but not by very much. It had somewhat larger arms, and the legs ran down into a pointed foot, with four claws very similar to the suit. The downy feathers ending halfway down the calf, and turning into tougher, leather-looking skin. But then he noticed their fingers ended in long, razor-sharp-looking talons. He looked over at Emily, and her hands, as she caught his look. We wear gloves to prevent us from stabbing everything we try to pick up or hold. Then, he looked back up at the display, watching a video of a Libertonian in flight. Their large back wings were powerful enough to keep them moving, while they used the gossamer dragonfly-like material between their sets of arms to steer and turn. Then he thought it over. Those legs looked more like something he pictured on a dinosaur, like a raptor. And her muzzle was pointed out straight like... Well, not like anything he knew offhand, but maybe a gator? Wait, weren't raptors birds? He gasped. The white feathers and wings had led him astray. They weren't just space eagles. They were flying space raptors. Space eagle raptors. Think that still works? He asked as he pointed at the suit. I mean, in theory, they keep artifacts in original format, and the reactor is rated for a thousand years, so maybe... He was staring at it, when they heard some sort of chime and looked around. The tourists and employees began to crowd around the nearest holographic information terminal, seeming to think something was happening. The map of the museum was replaced by some sort of space poodle, who looked fancier than usual. Dire and alarming news today. The council is announcing a state of war. There were murmurings of surprise all around. We're getting reports from the Aspace Empire that one of their primary worlds has been ruthlessly and savagely attacked. A new species known as the Americans has attacked their planet without an official declaration of war. The Aspace Empire is claiming this attack was unprovoked and completely against all council ethics. The Prime Matriarch insists these are mercenaries hired by our old enemies, the Libertonians. They call upon all council races to join them in a war against the new threat. An emergency session of the council has been called. In the meantime, they advise citizens to be on the alert for two highly dangerous terrorists. There was a picture that came up of Emily in her mask and suit and Billy Bob, made from security footage. Emily gasped as the tourists around them turned and looked. But as she looked at Billy Bob, he was running over towards the display with the battle suit. He picked up one of the exhibit signs and swung it, smashing it into the field generator on the side. There was an explosion as the device crackled and spluttered. The shield faded as the exosuit cops began to charge Billy Bob. Emily, get in the suit! We're going to take the gold record and get the fuck out! And so ends another chapter in the adventure of Billy Bob. Space Trucker.